Last time on Deconstructing Boomer Truth, I focused on a small-time community in the 1950s. This was a nice gentle way into the series, and I think a lot of people were attracted to the idyllic lifestyle of the 1950s milkman depicted here. But on today's episode, I want to challenge you all a lot more and take you out of your comfort zone. And so for today, I've selected some excerpts from Madison Grant's book from 1916, The Passing of the Great Race. This book has been associated with eugenics and was known to be a favourite of Adolf Hitler's. The reason I have chosen it is because it represents more or less the polar opposite worldview from that of the Boomer Truth regime. It was written long before America rewrote its own history to be one of anti-racism, which was in fact, partly a post hoc rationalization for its involvement in World War II, which was quite strongly resisted by the native population at the time. Once again, I will be using my three little characters here Boomer Waylon, Gen X Daria, and Millennial Medicine to break down today's text. But we're also going to be, to some extent, seeing the Waylon, Daria and Madison in ourselves, which is to say that some of the things Madison Grant brings up will be uncomfortable even for the most hardened so-called right-winger in 2020. So in deconstructing Boomer Truth, we also come to see to some extent the Boomer in ourselves. So let us begin. There exists today a widespread and fatuous belief in the power of environment, as well as of education and opportunity to alter heredity, which arises from the dogma of the brotherhood of man, derived in its turn from the loose thinkers of the French Revolution and their American mimics. Such beliefs have done much damage in the past, and if allowed to go uncontradicted, may do even more serious damage in the future. Just to say that it's interesting that such belief in the power of environment was as prevalent in 1916 as it is over 100 years later. Jean-Jacques Rousseau has a lot to answer for. Thus, the view that the Negro slave was an unfortunate cousin of the white man, deeply tanned by the tropic sun and denied the blessings of Christianity and civilization, played no small part with the sentimentalists of the Civil War period, and it has taken us 50 years to learn that speaking English, wearing good clothes, and going to school and to church do not transform a Negro into a white man. Nor was a Syrian or Egyptian freedman transformed into a Roman by wearing a toga and applauding his favorite gladiator in the amphitheater. Americans will have a similar experience with the Polish Jew, whose dwarf stature, peculiar mentality, and ruthless concentration on self-interest are being engrafted upon the stock of the nation. Here, Boomer Waylon would have the most basic response, which would be to object and say, we're all human, man. There is no black and white man. We're all the same underneath. There's just one race, the race of human beings. Perhaps some residual part of his brain might react, Richard Dawkins-like, to the fact that Grant is pinning this on utopian, universalist Christianity, rather than his own brand of hippydom. But he'd have no need to confront that. Maybe he'd think something like, well, man, religion has caused more wars than anything else, but that doesn't mean all people under the sun are not free and equal. The reference to the French thinkers that Grant is criticizing here would also likely be lost on him. Gen X Daria, I suspect, would try to respond by demonstrating that the claim isn't true. What about Uncle Phil on the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, she might say. It's just not true that black people can't be educated and join respectable society. But, of course, Daria is smart too. She'd understand that Uncle Phil might be an outlier, not typical, and might say something along the lines of black people still not having a quality of opportunity. And outcomes won't start to look different until other societal factors are addressed. Note, though, that as much as Daria might try to frame her answer in terms of data and science, she still, in the final analysis, has to accept the idea that the root causes are environmental and not biological. She does then believe, ultimately, that the differences between white and black people are only skin deep. Her view, in the end, is identical to Waylon's, only dressed up, 
with a greater veneer of quote-unquote science. And finally, millennial medicine is quite interesting on this question because ultimately her worldview does assert that you cannot make a black person into a white person. The entire framework of social justice relies ultimately on an essentialized view of race, which paradoxically makes her the closest person here to Madison Grant, in so much as she recognizes race as a reality, whereas Waylon and Daria, in some respects, erase or efface race as a factor. However, Madison inverts Grant's way of seeing things. What Grant put down to biology, Madison puts down to structural oppression. What Grant sees as innate, Madison puts down to a singular unwillingness on the part of white people to share their power or resources with other races, power and resources which have been, in her view, stolen by force from those other races. Now, of course, anyone who watches this channel understands how prosperity is made and knows that this final claim uh, is not true, economically speaking. But I think on a cultural level, millennial medicine might be getting at something else. Deep down, she believes that the person of color or the Syrian or the Egyptian or indeed the Polish Jew each have their own identity that will not and should not be assimilated into the power and truth regimes of the white man. But whereas Madison Grant might see this and seek to eject these people or to subjugate them, uh, and where Waylon and Daria actually seek to efface their differences, Millennial Medicine wants to embolden them in their separate identities and actually hand them power from the whites as some sort of retribution for past transgressions. Quite how she does this while denying the biological basis for race, which is a more logical move for Waylon and Daria, but not for her, is remarkable. But nonetheless, she manages it by erecting a dual morality whereby whiteness is uniquely evil and a power structure we are all trapped within, while every shade of non-whiteness creates its own specific point of resistance to that power structure. And so, by universalizing and abstracting the problem in this way, she never has to confront the fact that she has essentialized race in the same way that Madison Grant has. And this allows her to act as if race is real and essential, but then when questioned, to retreat back to the idea that it's all a construct of the evil white power regime made exactly by people like Grant himself. Okay, let's go back to the book. In many countries, the existing classes represent races that were once distinct. In the city of New York and elsewhere in the United States, there is a Native American aristocracy. Very quickly, when Grant says Native American, he means white people. And when he says Indian, he means what people call today Native American. Millennial medicine would be all over this naturally. But also I think Waylon and Daria would object to his use of the phrase lower races here for reasons I've discussed already. Resting upon layer after layer of immigrants of lower races and these Native Americans, while of course disclaiming the distinction of a patrician class and lacking in class consciousness and class dignity, have nevertheless up to this time supplied the leaders in thought and in the control of capital as well as of education and of the religious ideals and altruistic bias of the community. In the democratic forms of government, the operation of universal suffrage tends toward the selection of the average man for public office rather than the man qualified by birth, education, and integrity. How this scheme of administration will ultimately work out remains to be seen, but from a racial point of view, it will inevitably increase the preponderance of the lower types and cause a corresponding loss of efficiency in the community as a whole. The tendency in a democracy is toward a standardization of type and a diminution of the influence of genius. A majority must of necessity be inferior to a picked minority, and it always resents specializations in which it cannot share. 
In the French Revolution, the majority, calling itself the people, deliberately endeavored to destroy the higher type, and something of the same sort was in a measure done after the American Revolution by the expulsion of the loyalists and the confiscation of their lands, with a resultant loss to the growing nation of good race strains, which were in the next century replaced by immigrants of far lower type. In America, we have nearly succeeded in destroying the privilege of birth, that is, the intellectual and moral advantage a man of good stock brings into the world with him. We are now engaged in destroying the privilege of wealth, that is, the reward of successful intelligence and industry, and in some quarters there is developing a tendency to attack the privilege of intellect, and to deprive a man of the advantage gained from an early and thorough classical education. Simplified spelling is a step in this direction. So here, Waylon, as ever, would have level one reactions hey man did you see how many wars kings started there were a lot of bad kings in history you say it's good stock but how many kings and queens were inbred and so on and so forth naturally it wouldn't occur to waylon that in making this sort of argument he inadvertently reveals that he deep down accepts the underlying logic of genetics but it was not the habit of his age to think about such contradictions. He'd also reject the claim that the advantages of wealth or education had been undermined or eliminated by pointing out that we're all still a slave to the man, and we still aren't truly free. This oppression is bullshit, man. Daria, meanwhile, would be characteristically more detached and less emotional. But the impulse is similar. There's no truth in it, she'd say. Look at history and see how did all those aristocracies end up. All those who oppressed other races have been dethroned. She might even concede Grant's point that democracy always gives us bad leaders, whereas the old aristocratic systems at least gave us a chance of some wise ones once in a while. But Daria is perfectly comfortable saying, yeah, it's shit, but that's life. Deal with it. Besides, whatever it is that Grant wants is in the past in any case. We are much more advanced now, and therefore this way of thinking is outmoded. It's just not realistic to imagine we could go back to thinking like that again. And for Daria, this might be her quote-unquote red pill. This is her looking through the matrix in her very cynical way and seeing the unvarnished truth. But interestingly stripped back, it's just the same truth that the generation of her father, the generation of Boomer Waylon, would have outlined, albeit dressed up with more stats and intelligence. Millennial medicine, though, she is in a bind here. White history is evil. Western man is evil. The European idea of progress is bullshit in her view. So how can she process this actual white supremacist pointing out that the process of capitalism and democracy have been in themselves regressive from his point of view? My suspicion is that this point would actually be beyond her. It would be lost on her. That's a little bit too much like thinking, which is much harder than repeating near automatic slogans and mantras and so instead i think she would fixate on pointing out the racism and looking at a piece like this as proof that america was born in sin and she'd leave it at that but where does grant go from here let's have a look Ignorance of English grammar or classic learning must not forsooth be held up as a reproach to the political or social aspirant Mankind emerged from savagery and barbarianism under the leadership of selected individuals whose personal prowess, capacity, or wisdom gave them the right to lead and the power to compel obedience. Such leaders have always been a minute fraction of the whole, but as long as the tradition of their predominance persisted, they were able to use the brute strength of the unthinking herd as part of their own force, and were able to direct at will the blind dynamic impulse of the slaves, peasants, or lower classes. Such a despot had an enormous power at his disposal, which, if he were benevolent or even intelligent, could be used, and most frequently was used, for the general uplift of the race. 
even those rulers who most abused this power put down with merciless rigor the antisocial elements, such as pirates, brigands, or anarchists, which impair the progress of a community, as disease or wounds cripple an individual. True aristocracy, or a true republic, is government by the wisest and best, always a small minority in any population. Human society is like a serpent dragging its long body on the ground, but with the head always thrust a little in advance and a little elevated above the earth. The serpent's tail in human society represented by the antisocial forces was in the past dragged by sheer strength along the path of progress. Such has been the organization of mankind from the beginning, and such it still is in older communities than ours. What progress humanity can make under the control of universal suffrage, or the rule of the average, may find a further analogy in the habits of certain snakes, which wiggle sideways and disregard the head with its brains and eyes. Such serpents, however, are not noted for their ability to make rapid progress. A true republic, the function of which is administration in the interests of the whole community, in contrast to a pure democracy, which in last analysis is the rule of the demos or a majority in its own interests, should be, and often is, the medium of selection for the technical task of government, of those best qualified by antecedents, character and education, in short, of experts. To use another simile, in an aristocratic as distinguished from a plutocratic or democratic organization, the intellectual and talented classes form the point of the lance, while the massive shaft represents the body of the population, and adds by its bulk and weight to the penetrative impact of the tip. In a democratic system, this concentrated force is dispersed throughout the mass. It supplies, to be sure, a certain amount of leaven, but in the long run the force and genius of the small minority is dissipated, and its efficiency lost. Vox Populi, so far from being Vox Dei, thus becomes an unending wail for rights and never a chant of duty. Now this is making largely the same argument, but in a more poetic way, using this metaphor of a serpent, its head, its body, and its tail, for the wisest, the masses, and the worst among us, respectively. So we don't really need to retrace all of the various responses, but I suspect that Daria would feel compelled to point out the scientific advances since 1945 as some way of disproving Grant. Waylon, I imagine, just zones out here. He can't concentrate for this long. But some aspect of millennial medicine actually agrees with this. This is quite literally her own view of the situation. It's just that what she wants is the 180 degree inversion of what Grant wants. Only her idea of the wisest is some woke activist professor. If Madison Grant could time travel 100 years into the future, he'd see his namesake as the proof of the degenerative process of democracy. He'd argue that everything this millennial believes is the total inversion of the truth, putting the lowest orders on top while all but eliminating the quote-unquote wisest from power and even from society altogether. Meanwhile, for Madison herself, Grant is the gift from history that seems to prove everything that she's been saying. I leave it for you to decide who you most identify with on this and move on. Where a conquering race is imposed on another race, the institution of slavery often arises to compel the servient race to work and to introduce it forcibly to a higher form of civilization. As soon as men can be induced to labor to supply their own needs, slavery becomes wasteful and tends to vanish. From a material point of view, slaves are often more fortunate than freemen when treated with reasonable humanity, and when their elemental wants of food, clothing, and shelter are supplied. The Indians around the fur posts in northern Canada were formerly the virtual bond slaves of the Hudson Bay Company, each Indian and his squaw and papoose being adequately supplied with simple food and equipment. He was protected as well against the white man's rum as the red man's scalping parties, and in return gave the company all his peltries, the whole product of his year's work. From an Indian's point of view, this was nearly an ideal condition, but was to all intents serfdom or slavery. 
when through the opening up of the country the continuance of such an archaic system became an impossibility, the Indian sold his furs to the highest bidder, received a large price in cash, and then wasted the proceeds in trinkets instead of blankets, and in rum instead of flour, with the result that he is now gloriously free but is on the high road to becoming a diseased outcast. In this case of the Hudson Bay Indian, the advantages of the upward step from serfdom to freedom are not altogether clear. A very similar condition of vassalage existed until recently among the peons of Mexico, but without the compensation of the control of an intelligent and provident ruling class. In the same way, serfdom in medieval Europe apparently was a device through which the landowners repressed the nomadic instinct in their tenantry, which became marked when the fertility of the land declined after the dissolution of the Roman Empire. Years are required to bring land to its highest productivity, and agriculture cannot be successfully practiced even in well-watered and fertile districts by farmers who continually drift from one locality to another. The serf or villain was, therefore, tied by law to the land, and could not leave except with his master's consent. As soon as the nomadic instinct was eliminated, serfdom vanished. One has but to read the severe laws against vagrancy in England just before the Reformation to realize how widespread and serious was this nomadic instinct. And so this part of Grant's argument is the one I suspect that will be the most triggering to virtually anyone and everyone watching this. And before I go on, let me make it abundantly clear that I think that slavery is morally abhorrent and indefensible, and as a staunch classical liberal, think it is a very great thing that it was abolished. But, and there is a but, Grant is getting at some rather uncomfortable facts here. His point that some slaves were materially better off and even happier before their emancipation is something we can see in the historical record. In the 1930s and 1940s, the Library of Congress interviewed hundreds of former slaves. Most of these were old people in their 80s, 90s, some of them even over 100 years old, with memories of the US Civil War. Many of them had fought in that war. And reading these first-hand accounts of slavery is quite eye-opening. In fact, such is the picture that we get from them that the website which hosts them puts a disclaimer in the introduction explaining why so many of these accounts paint a rosier picture than we might expect. It says, certainly the interviews in the slave narrative collection present problems beyond the general issue of reliability and accuracy of recollections of the past. Not only had more than 70 years elapsed between emancipation and the time of the interviews, but most informants had experienced slavery only as children or adolescents. Those interviews were extremely old, and most were living in conditions of abject poverty during the Depression years of the 1930s. These factors often combined to make them look upon the past through rose-coloured glasses. They fondly described events and situations that had not been, in reality, so positive as they recalled them. Moreover, it is apparent that some informants, mistaking the interviewer for a government representative who might somehow assist them in their economic plight, replied to questions with flattery and calculated exaggeration in an effort to curry the interviewer's favour. Exaggeration may often have been the consequence of the interview itself, which gave informants an opportunity to be the centre of attention. Now, it's interesting to me that here we see a little glitch in the matrix. We are supposed to believe that slavery is an ultimate evil, which I actually do think, by the way. Uh, maybe this is the boomer in me. But yet the actual accounts of slavery from former slaves do not paint it in an entirely negative light. The impulse of the boomer truth regime is immediately to pathologize this, to psychologize it, to explain that somehow they're old black people in the 1930s and 40s and they didn't really mean or believe the things they said, that their memories were defective in some way. I note that the suggestion that good things might have been exaggerated is front and centre here, but the suggestion that tales of brutality might have been exaggerated is not. 
Well, as it happens, I've spent a good number of hours uh, looking over some of these testimonies and a few things stood out to me. First is that despite the disclaimer here, there are many tales of genuine brutality that are very difficult to read. I won't share them, but they made me feel quite angry at the sheer sadism of it all. If you've seen 12 Years a Slave, for example, you already know the half of it. But it was also interesting that these tales, the, the, the tales of bad masters, seem to be the exception rather than the rule. And also that such tales were nearly always second-hand accounts, which is to say it was somebody repeating a story they were told by a parent or of something happening on another plantation. There's one story, for example, of the KKK stringing up a man's wife on a tree and stabbing her to death. And then this man got a rifle and killed 14 Klansmen in revenge. Now, obviously, this is a remarkable story, but one can see how something like that might have been the stuff of legend in some of these communities. The majority of the testimonies are much more like this people pointing out that their masters were very kind, that they were never hurt by any of them, and that they were relatively happy living on the plantation, and so on and so forth. And also that while they were excited when the Civil War came and to join the forces of Lincoln and Ulysses S. Grant, freedom actually resulted in more hardship than they'd known before. As this account says, after the Civil War, the slaves who were for the most part uncivilized and ignorant found it very difficult to adjust themselves to their new life as free persons. Formerly, they lived on the land of their masters, and although compelled to work long hours, their food and lodging were provided for them. After their emancipation, this life was changed. They were free and had to think for themselves and make a living. Times for the Negro then were much the same as during the Depression. Several of the slaves sorted out to secure jobs, but all found it difficult to adjust themselves to the new life and difficult to secure employment. Many came back to their old owners and many were afraid to leave and continued on much as before. And this goes back to Madison Grant's point about the Hudson Bay Indians. If you're broke, if you're addicted to rum, if you're addicted to gambling, is being free really all it's cracked up to be? How would our three characters answer this and how might you answer it? Boomer Waylon might even argue that getting drunk under the stars is freedom man and maybe he's thinking of his own time at Woodstock or some other festival getting wasted on drugs. As we've seen Waylon is not a particularly deep thinker and it would never occur to him that these hedonistic choices like drink, drugs and so on are in themselves a form of trap, a form of control, a form of oppression. Daria, meanwhile, might struggle with this a little bit more. She has seen the mistakes of Waylon up close and privately knows not to repeat them. But she would rationalise it by saying that the freedom to fail, the freedom to mess up, is the price you pay for freedom. In other words, it's a trade-off. More freedom in exchange for less security. She might also ask this question. Would you choose to be a slave or a serf? You're very safe in prison, but would you give up your freedom to go there? And here the cynicism of self-interest is used as the ultimate trump card. Now I suspect a lot of people viewing this will be thinking along similar lines. But where is Madison Grant even coming from with this view? Is he just a bad old white supremacist with nothing of any value whatsoever to tell us? Well, I think he's appealing to a very old idea that very much rankles with our modern sensibilities. Namely, it's for your own good. And the related idea 
of the feudal notion of service or bondage, which is the idea that people might ultimately feel more fulfilled some, serving something bigger than themselves, like a wise master. We glimpse this idea a little bit in pop culture. Think of Daniel San and Mr. Miyagi in The Karate Kid, or Luke Skywalker and Yoda, or the master in Kill Bill. The image is often orientalized and limited to something like martial arts, which makes it somewhere over there and therefore safe. But this is the residual force of the ancient idea that Grant is appealing to. And studies have shown a long-term decline in happiness as the social bonds that he's talking about have been broken. Note in these graphs, the fact that happiness went down during the greater freedom of the swinging 60s and actually went up with the election of Adolf Hitler in Germany and the lesser freedom that resulted from that. As women have been granted greater freedom, their happiness relative to men has decreased. So-called deaths of despair as well as suicides have skyrocketed since 1890. People have become more angry, sadder, and feel more shame now than they ever did in the past. Although, interestingly, there seems to be an uptick in quote-unquote joy too. Could that be the Star Wars toy box opening or viral cat videos well who knows but it might just be possible that in abolishing some of these terrible old institutions such as slavery the boomer truth regime also threw out the baby with the bathwater which is to say that old concepts such as service loyalty duty and so on practically missing in today's world may very well have made people feel safer and happier. Let me know what you think. Now get out.